Africans from the diaspora who feel as though we threw them away. We didn't mm -hmm. fight mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. Because it is true that there was African complicity, mm -hmm. you know, in slavery. Mm -hmm. It couldn't have happened otherwise. Mm -hmm. There were African chiefs who were actively involved. It made them very rich. They became very, very wealthy mm -hmm. from participating in the slave trade. And so there's a resentment. There's a resentment um, from, and we say Africans in the, in the diaspora, so African Americans, but also Africans from the Caribbean. Yeah. I once had a Caribbean girl say to me, you know, you guys, you threw us away. You Ooh. didn't want us. Mm. And I have seen from living in London the enmity that exists between Afro-Caribbeans and Africans. Like, if there's a fight in a nightclub, it's Africans <laughs> on both ends of the spectrum who are fighting. It's Afro-Caribbean men and Africans fighting in a nightclub. Like, there was, that was always happening. I watched a fight on a bus happen Damn. between... Um, an African and, and an Afro-Caribbean person. Like, it was really yeah. frightening. And there's that tension, there's that resentment that continues to exist. And we Africans are on this side saying, I, I wasn't in that story. <laughs> I am of the 20th century. I wasn't in that, I wasn't in that deal. So there is, there is a tension. Welcome to Black to Africa. I'm Tadre Mornier, a California native living her best life in Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you for coming along for the ride. I hope that you are informed, entertained, and inspired to Black it to Africa. Oh gosh. Welcome back to Black it to Africa. I'm so excited. I have a special guest, Miss Janet Onyango. Yes? That's right. Okay, I said it correctly. And she's Kenyan, and I'm gonna allow her to introduce herself please sure so i'm janet mm -hmm. atieno atieno that's my that's my that's my middle name okay uh, onyango so uh i am kenyan i'm Lu. i'm from south nyanza i'm from mawendo south nyanza and that is kind of um so if if nyanza is west of kenya Awendo um, is south of the lake, south of Lake Victoria. Nice. So that whole lower Nyanza kind of, kind of goes around the lake. We're kind of south of that, closer to the border of Tanzania. Ooh. In fact, my grandmother was Lu from the Tanzanian side. Mm -hmm. And um, so I haven't quite understood the story of how my grandfather was able to make her leave mm -hmm. and come across mm -hmm. the border to, to, to Kenya with him. But, but those are my roots. Yeah. And what do you do? So I work in communications. Okay. Uh, I am, you know, so social media, website maintenance, um, writing articles for, for different uh, for different companies. And right now I'm doing that for an NGO in conservation. And I'm also doing it on a part-time basis for another, for a tech company, a tech startup. Okay, we'll have to talk more about that because you know I'm, I'm do, I do similar work before companies and SMEs in the States. Yes, so I'm so happy to have you here and today we're talking about the chasm between Africans and African Americans or maybe we could mm -hmm. even say Africans and Africans in the diaspora, mm -hmm. those of us who were stolen. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I want to discuss this because whenever I talk to people about coming back to Africa, specifically people of a certain generation, baby boomers, my dad's generation, that's the first thing they bring up. Do they even like us over there? Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's so much uh, with that. As occasionally, but not often, I'll get it from people who are my generation, um, Gen X, but I don't really hear it from younger. So I want to address that. And the purpose of this podcast, again, is to encourage my people to return home. From my experience, from what I pick up on in the news, and I don't even read the news. So, of course, I get the, the things that are most sensationalized that fall on my timeline. And it's just us being mistreated. 
and I want us to self-actualize. So this podcast is coming from a place of love for my people, love for humanity. And I was like, all right, let's have this conversation mm -hmm. between myself, an African-American woman, and you, a Kenyan woman, an African woman, someone who was born here and for the most part raised. But you have to, you have to give us, and that's another reason why I wanted to have you on, because you have a very unique perspective. You bounced around quite a bit. So tell us about that. Sure, sure, sure. So I was born in Kenya. My, my parents had me here, and then very soon after that, moved to West Africa, so to, to Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, and that's where I grew up, and that's when my siblings were born, so we have, there's four of us. My siblings were, we were all born there. So we were raised in an expat community in, in, Cote, in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, and so, and because of that, because of being in that expat community, I grew up in a very sort of international space. We spoke French. We spoke English at home, we ate Kenyan food at home, but then as soon as we left, there was every other kind of food. There was, you know, Ivorian food and there was, there were so many cultural influences. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and, and so that was most of my school life. And then for my um, high school, by the time I was ready to be in high school, I'm the eldest of four, we had moved to Zimbabwe mm -hmm. and we lived in Harare for a long time as well. So my whole high school was, was in Harare. So there was that experience as well of being in mm -hmm. Southern Africa and, and everything that that means because, you know, Africa is so fantastic and diverse. Yes. And then, um, then I went away to university in the UK and my family, you know, stayed and moved back to, to Abidjan for several different reasons, um, di dictating that move, that move back. But that has left me with a sense of being very much Pan-African mm -hmm. and very much a citizen of the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, I grew up in, in very mixed Africa. And so I grew up with white people who were Africans from that Southern Africa experience. Mm. In Zim. In Zim. Um, that's very much a, a sort of a, a legacy of, of Southern Africa is there are white Africans, mm -hmm. there are Africans of every shade, every mm -hmm. language background, every, you know, and also that West African experience is also a very mixed experience. Mm -hmm. To be African is to be multilingual, is mm -hmm. to be multicultural. Yes. Um, and I, I feel Pan-African, when people ask me where you're from, it's actually a hard question for me to answer. <laughs> Where am I from? What do they call people like you? Third, third culture. Yes, I'm very much a third culture. Child. Yes, yeah. yes, very and I, you know, when you say that, I'm like, I, I feel a flavor. I see a flavor. Like I've loved your style. Oh, I, I'm going to tell everybody how we met, but I love your style. And would you say that this flavor? Does it exude from your experience in West Africa, or is it just a you know amalgamation of many experiences? Mm -hmm. I, I would say it's from my experience in West Africa. Yeah, because um, who is more fashionable than West Africa? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, who has more of a sense of style than people and from West just Africa? confidence? You know, what I'm saying? <laughs> just who gonna tell me I don't look good? You know, what I'm saying. Who dare to tell me I don't look good? <laughs> and I see, I see so much connection between African Americans and West Africans because most of most of our lineage can be traced there. Yeah. And for us specifically in the U.S., it's Nigeria, yeah. and Nigerians are so dramatic. Yes. Just be like that. There's too much pepper. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> But that's us in yeah. the states. We just be like at work like this. What I'm not gonna do. <laughs> At work, wondering why you got fired. Okay, so uh, were your parents diplomats? Is that the reason for the move? Yes, so, so my, my father worked with the African Development Bank, mm -hmm. which was um, the sort of Pan-African organization that was based in, in Abidjan. So when, when we first moved there, my parents first moved there, it was, that was the headquarters. Eventually they developed all these regional offices and that's how we moved to Zimbabwe. Mm. And then um, war came to Abidjan while I was at university, my parents were living there, and so the office moved them to Tunisia. Mm. So that was another place that my parents lived and that I went to visit. I mean, I visited them there really more than lived there. But um, there was also, that was an interesting period as well, going to visit them in Tunisia, in a part of Africa that doesn't consider itself Africa. 
Mm. <laughs> and that was my first experience with that. I was like, um, I'm pretty sure the map, the map says you guys are in Africa. I was right. you don't feel yeah. African so and so. That was a, a different experience as well. So yes, so yes. So my father's diplomatic background is what created. Okay, I, I do want to get into that. Let's not gloss over that. This notion that you know you're not African, even though your country is positioned on the continent. So I've experienced that specifically with Ethiopians. Mm -hmm. Like I love mm -hmm. y'all, mm -hmm. but those of y'all that I've encountered from these upper classes in the United States, be, sometimes y'all be on some different shit. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, wait, what? How are you? You know, I get, you know, the thousands of years of commerce and intermingling with the Arab world and with Europe, you know, um, and with the Asian world as well. That's I right. get that. However, you're still in Africa. <laughs> Egypt is another one, mm -hmm. right? So you're also definitely. saying you experienced that in Tunisia. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was very confusing to me. Um, Africans who don't consider themselves African. I saw it as well in South Africa. Um, in South Africa, South Africans will call the rest of Africa, Africa. <laughs> themselves, <laughs> themselves, South Africa, you know, they consider Even themselves Even with the black South Africans. Yes. Are you serious? Especially the black South Africans who will call other Africans Africans, but not, you know, they don't extend that <laughs> to themselves. Mm -hmm. Very strange, very strange mentality. Yeah. So in Tunisia, I can understand because as you say, there's the Arab influence and they look very much to Europe. Tunisians look very much to France um, for, you know, for their influences. And so, um, and then there's that Roman um, history that you can even see Roman ruins in Tunis. Mm. Um, so they don't consider themselves, you know, Africans. They, in, in their mind, that color divide um, is, is, is the difference. We are black and they're not black. And so we were very much oddities. Um, when the African Development Bank first moved there, um, there was just suddenly this influx of black africans mm. into the city mm -hmm. and they were just a spectacle people traffic stopped people would stare in the supermarket really? like it was it was <laughs> so you were otherized we were definitely otherized was it traumatizing yeah. at all um you know my so my parents experienced it more than me because i spent less time in tunisia than they did i don't know if they were traumatized because there was enough of a community around them that they could ignore that i think but they definitely um, felt othered. What about your, your younger siblings? So <clears throat> my younger siblings also were at school at the okay. time, so my parents were kind of there. But my, my, my brother was there with my parents, and also he didn't, you know, he was in an international school, and so was able to kind of get past that. Oh, okay, at an international yeah. school. Yeah. So you were able to kind of be in a little bubble where... Right. Exactly. Oh my exactly. gosh. But it did mean that every time you got in the car to go somewhere, you just knew that it was it's just gonna be a drama, a spectacle. Just black. Yeah. <laughs> just yes. like, to be Ooh, black you know, trying to navigate to yeah. you. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, I went to Morocco, um, where were we, Marrakesh and Fez. And um, it was just interesting, people looking at me because they actually do have very dark people mm -hmm. in Morocco, mm -hmm. but they tend to live in a certain area but even, you know, me coming there and looking the way I look, they were just kind of like. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the, the black, black skin folk maybe are sort of out there in a, as you say, in a particular part of the country. So the confidence of you to just be kind of walking around, yeah. they must have been like. Oh. They kept calling me Fatima, Fatima, oh. Fatima. Oh. And I found out later, I think. Well, Fatima was the black wife of one of their prophets. Oh. I, I, I don't remember which prophet. So I've spoken to another black American woman who was there. She said she had the same experience. Oh. People just calling. I was like, is Fatima the equivalent of Tyrone? You know, yeah. why are people keep <laughs> calling me Fatima? We're off subject. We can go yeah. off. We can go off way off topic. I just want to tell everyone how we met. Mm -hmm. So we met at Alchemist, which is now shut down. We're going to get into Alchemist. We met at Alchemist, which is a cool little spot in Nairobi where they have DJs, there's a stage, there's a dance floor. It's pretty expat-y, I would say. 
but there's also like a lot of Kenyans that go, a lot of Africans, I will just say, will go there and they have, you know, different bars, different retail spaces, and then also different eateries all in this one mm -hmm. spot. Yeah. And I was new to Nairobi and I just wanted to kick it, you know, and the Alchemist was really my first introduction into the Nairobi party scene. And I get there and they got good drinks upstairs. What is it called? Cinnamon? Yes. They had good drinks. Yes. I get there and I'm just like, I'm going to do the cool auntie thing. You know, I'm going to sip my drink <laughs> and I'm going to be perched up high and watch all the youngins, you know, twerk or whatever. And I'm going to be, I'm going to be there, but I'm not going to be of it. <laughs> and then I saw you and you had a book, you know, you had your feet propped up and I said, you know because you have style show the people your rings show them your rings you know what i'm saying i was like who is this fly woman reading a book and i'm like oh she's an auntie too we started started the conversation next thing you know we was twerking from up high it was a good time it was great it was great and we kept in contact yeah. i was like this is somebody that i want to you know know more about that i want to meet I've very much been in an expat bubble, specifically a Black American expat bubble. I work from home, mm -hmm. so um, you know I don't really get out. Mm -hmm. And then I've invited you to a couple of events, etc. However, Alchemist has been <laughs> shut down I know. recently I know. because of the BS. So Alchemist has been shut down. Now, I have a whole episode I'm going to do on racism yeah. in Africa, yeah. discrimination in yeah. Africa. Yeah. 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 But can you speak to what's going on? No, <laughs> I, um, so what I heard happened at the Alchemist is that someone was denied entry, right? Was denied entry and the person felt that it was a racist, they were excluded because of their race, which is quite strange because I've never been excluded from, from the Alchemist. Um, so um, it remains, you know, I, I, I found that very strange. I've never heard of anybody complain about that. However, I have heard of people feeling like they were treated differently mm -hmm. at establishments mm -hmm. because they were not white or, you know, because, you know, on, on racial, on racial grounds. Racism in, in, in Africa is a real thing. Unfortunately, it is a real thing. It does happen. Um, I feel like more in some parts of Africa than others. Yeah. I don't think this kind of thing happens in West Africa. Um, they just wouldn't tolerate it. They would just be too much noise about it. They just wouldn't tolerate it. But I think the influence of colonialism mm -hmm. is more strongly felt in some parts of Africa than others. Mm -hmm. Less in West Africa, I feel, and mm -hmm. certainly more in East Africa. Certainly, mm -hmm. certainly more. And there's an obsequiousness, you know, towards white people that I have seen, witnessed for myself. Um, and and unfortunately, you know white people are made to feel very much more comfortable in East Africa than they would be in other parts of Africa. So there, there is a definitely a problem with racism. Um, with, yeah, It's subtle. Sometimes it's not subtle. I think coming from the States, I'm ready for it. <laughs> it's like, oh, you I know. Mean, you go into spaces and you feel like you have to fight for your rights sometimes. You, you do, for sure. I have definitely felt it. I have felt like I have to be a little bit louder or a little bit more um, brash and, mm. and it's it's real it's a real thing i have never experienced that that particular venue though i was quite surprised to hear yeah. that, that incident happened yeah um, and saddened that it's been it's been closed as a result but it, it um mm. look <laughs> burn it down no i'm not, I'm not. <laughs> I, you we're know, not I, here for that. If yeah, that's what happened, then for sure we're not here for that. I'm, I'm definitely, you know, I'm. I try not to bring my American politics where I where I come. Mm -hmm. You know, where mm -hmm. I go. Mm -hmm. However, I saw the video. Mm -hmm. Did you see the video? No, I did not. There's a video. I've never been to the Alchemist where they have this barricade set up, but maybe that happens later on in the evening. Mm -hmm. I tend to go yeah. pretty early. Yeah, they have this barricade set up at the entrance. Yep. And on one side, it was a row of Indian men, mm -hmm. Indian descent, or maybe I'll just say Asian descent looking men. And on the other side was African men. Mm -hmm. And there was an African man that went over to that other side and the, the bouncer, who was an African man, mm -hmm. was like, uh -uh, you go over to, over to the other one, wow. over to the other. 
Yeah. Why was that happening? Because usually when they have those barricades, it's like men on one side, women on the other. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, and so what I'm happy about yeah. is that the Kenyan government has come through and shut it down. Yeah. And this is where social media is so helpful because Twitter, you know, all this just went viral on Twitter. And I've heard about this happening in Uganda. Mm -hmm. Ugandan government shutting it down, you know, deporting people. Mm -hmm. You know, I just like, if I didn't like Asians, I wouldn't move to Asia. Mm -hmm. If you don't like Africans, why are you in Africa? I've experienced it here from um, uh, in expat owned spaces, yes. yeah. and uh, yeah, it's just and the and in my in my uh, WhatsApp Black expat group, they were talking about how the Alchemist is owned by uh, two Indian descent guys mm -hmm. and one Chinese American mm -hmm. guy. I don't know how factual that is, yeah, yeah. but you know, they put out a statement. The statement was also shared in my group and the Alchemist is just basically like, we're, we're going to review the tape and you know, we stand for this, we stand for that, blah, blah, blah. You know, very PR friendly. Yeah, yeah, language. <sighs> but I'm gonna tell you, I've experienced it in Ghana when I was a student. Uh, there were clubs, and this, I don't know if this still exists, but there were clubs back in the uh, mid 90s that uh, would only allow in Lebanese men, or I should say Lebanese people, mm -hmm. and African women. Mm -hmm. If you were an African man trying to get in that club, they would turn you away. Wow. I saw it for myself. Wow. And so it was one of those things where women would go there because Lebanese men gave yeah. them access to money, to resources. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. and then you get up in there and it's nothing but Lebanese men and then us. Right? So it was like, mm, I think I know what's going on yes. here. Yeah. I don't need to go back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's quite blatant. That is yeah, super that's amazing. very blatant. Yeah. And I hope the Ghanaian oh government gosh. eventually shut that down. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately, there's also that angle. As you say, there's, there's also um, a divide, a racial divide um, between the Indian community and, 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 the, and the Black African community. Um, the, it's there on sort of racial grounds, but also there's, a, there's an economic sort of aspect to it as well. They tend to be wealthier, you know, than Africans, but, um, and they tend to own a lot of the business areas and therefore very rich industrialists, very, very big business yeah. concerns are, yeah. are Asian owned in, in Kenya. Yeah. And so, so there's that as well. Um, and, um, uh, gosh, I'm not sure how to, it, it's a very big discussion. And we could go down a very, a very deep hole. It, it a is, very it deep is a hole with hole. that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, but it is it is real. Like never, never, don't ever imagine that um, it's a certain part. You know, no. it's it's something that you can see very, very blatantly. If you go, for example, to the Ashaya Street, which is uh, you know a commercial street, which is a, a long street full of sort of Indian-owned shops. More recently, Chinese in Nairobi. In Nairobi, mm -hmm. so it's a street where you can. So we used to go there traditionally to buy fabric. Lots of fabric, you know, curtains. You need a curtains, you went to get Shire Street. Hmm. Instead of Eastley. Instead of Eastley. Wow. Eastley okay. is a more recent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Eastley is a more recent. So now there's, there are lots more Chinese shops there, but um, many of those businesses are Indian owned, and it's always the same scenario. You walk into the shop, the Indian owner is at the till, making sure that they're guarding the money, mm -hmm. and the person helping you is an African who um, is being ordered around. Get, go, get, 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 come, go in the most disrespectful tone and so yeah. their way of retaliating against that is they find little ways to steal mm -hmm. from their Indian mm -hmm. owners and so they do little deals with you under the table where you mm -hmm. can get this for cheaper if you pay cash and like this you know so there, there's lots of um it's very tense it's very ugly yeah. and it's there it's definitely it's it's really ugly um my experience with Indians initially is in the U.S. we're all American you know, they are more proximate to whiteness, so right. they don't get it as bad. Yes. But however, yeah. they get it. Yes. You know what yes. I'm saying? <laughs> and, and I went to school with them, and we're cool, and it's just, 
it's great. Um, it's been a, a good experience for me. What I started to see a lot more in the U.S. when I left was, you know, Indian American men married with, coupled with Black American women, oh. more and more. Oh. Um, and, you know, I had a homeboy in law school who was working on this class action suit to help Black farmers, mm -hmm. which was just like, mm -hmm. you know, um, the only negative experience I had was going, I went to an Indian restaurant and I, they, I was sat next to a family. Mm -hmm. I was by myself and they had a grandmother mm -hmm. who was dressed in, dressed in traditional sari and she looked like she looked like they had sat shit next to her. Mm -hmm. You know, like maybe she, in her so mind, so. I was a Dalit. Yes. You know, yeah. and and her her family noticed it. Her mm -hmm. children, her grandchildren noticed it, but they didn't they didn't say Granny like chill. You know what I mean? They yeah. didn't correct Granny yeah. at all. Yeah. And I was in the mindset I should have gotten up and left, mm -hmm. but I was like, I'm not going. So I consequently I did enjoy my meal. Mm -hmm. She just kept looking at me like I. Oh, you know, it was really, it was really, she couldn't, she oh, was so gosh. insulted. But that was oh, my wow. only negative experience yeah. in the U.S. Then I come to East Africa and I was like, immediately I felt it. I said, what is this? And then I'm a soci I was a sociology major. So now I'm watching how Indian descent and Africans are interacting with each other. I'm, they're ignoring each other. That's right. And I was like, okay, what is, and I knew the history but I had to go deeper to, I was like, let me, let me deep dive to really understand yeah, what's happening. Yeah, there's a definite imbalance. Um, and so every now and again, you'll hear about a couple, you know, an Indian girl with an African man. And, it, and it's so serious that it makes the news. Like it's, <laughs> there was one girl who married, uh, was in a relationship with a, with a Korean man. And it was on the news. Like that's the kind of story that can make the news. <laughs> But the news here, I mean, the news, I'm, I'm not to say the U.S. is better, but so the newspapers here read like tabloids. Yes. <laughs> and they're mainstream. The mainstream, <laughs> the news, mainstream yeah. newspaper. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I so know. Maybe it was a slow news. Day, but that was a story in the news. No, it, it is shocked. something. You see a child um, who... Um, who is multi-ethnic here, okay. and it's like, oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can I see that often? You know, you see, you see a Indian man actually like holding the hand of his African woman, and it's just like, oh, uh, that's <laughs> happening exactly. It, but, yeah. but even more sinister is that other Africans will look at her and make assumptions about yeah. her. They'll be like, oh, she must be. Humans <laughs> go human. That's all. That's my humans go human. <laughs> You know, she must be a uh, lady of the evening, you know, who's just like come up, you know, or, or just very ugly assumptions are made. Same thing if a woman is dating a black, a white man. Oh, you know, they get it real like, bad. You know, it's just like, did you really? <laughs> did you? Mm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's such a look. And that's the other thing that I, I skipped over that Alchemist was really popular for. There's, you know, sex workers are alchemists, sex you know? Workers, exactly. And even if they weren't like, you know, full time sex workers, it's like, hey, let me go over there and see what I can get. Right. You know? It's so amazing. when I say sex workers, I mean male, female, yes. gigolos, right. whatever you want to right. call them. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's known for that. It's a hunting ground. For sure. Mm -hmm. for sure. And when you're, but then the flip side is like, but when you are an African, woman and you're not interested in being hunted or being a hunter right the attitude from these non-african men is just like well what's wrong with you you know and they assume you want them they just exactly. assume yeah. you want them and it's like no i have a bank account and i'm just enjoying myself I just gave you a little <laughs> drink, excuse me, please. Exactly. But it's, they're happy because they don't want anybody. They, they're not looking for nobody. They got an opinion. No, they got a mouth. No. But yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They're like, they if kinda... you have an opinion, then it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Let's just move on and find someone who actually thinks we are a prize. And we find someone who thinks we're a prize. So, 
yeah it's oh very it's it's hectic it's it's <laughs> and that's part of the reason why the dating scene i think is so difficult in my mm -hmm. it's because of that dynamic um, oh my goodness i just have to i have to just share this one little story i was at the arboretum just going for a walk i was meeting a friend and this nigerian guy who was probably you know late 60s um he had been living in the states for decades um but he's doing business here in kenya so you know he approached me and he just wanted to talk to me about this app that he was developing blah 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 he invited me and my friend to his home okay. for lunch we declined but I, I gave him my number anyway because i was like maybe we can do business the man calls me up and he's just like, oh, you know, would you would you like to come over to my house for lunch, or whatever? And I just flat out was like, I'm not interested in anything romantic with you. Ooh, the way the man, he just <laughs> the way <laughs> he started stuttering. But this the, this is what got me. He was like, you know, all the beautiful women in Kenya, like why? You know, why would I ever? I said, oh, now I'm basic. <laughs> now you went from calling me up. <laughs> Asking me to lunch to 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 basically throwing me in the pool with everybody else because there's so many beautiful women in Kenya. Why would he? You know, I was like, I just hung up. <laughs> it went. He, he went there so so quick. <laughs> with his old oh, ass. Oh, <laughs> there's also like a fragility about you know the African male. Very fragile. Can't take even a little bit of pushback. Even a little bit is too much. Too much. Sorry about that, Paula. But um, yeah, the dating scene is very, very difficult because of that. Because of those dynamics around transactional dating. That's a good word. Transactional um, dating. Yeah, yeah. So it's very murky and hectic. Anyway. <laughs> we, that's not why we're here, <laughs> but we can't, you know, you're getting a real, the thing, the thing of, that I do want, I want to be honest and truthful is this is not a utopia. It's not perfect, but it's better than the U S and I sure. hope through this podcast to give you a little flavor yeah. of what it's, it's better than the U S I can complain all day about the dating scene here. However, when I was in the States, I could complain all day the about the thing. dating scene. Yeah, yeah, I could do the same thing. Right. And here we are sitting here as, you know, African women having this conversation. But white expats have the same conversation. And I, I'm listening. I'm like, they going through the same thing I'm going through? <laughs> it's just patriarchy. You know, it's just patriarchy. It is. It is. It's less about physical location and more about, as you say, the patriarchy. That's really all it is. Not make make the right connections. Exactly. So may identify the reasons why it's difficult. It's difficult because there's the patriarchy. It's difficult because, you know, it's got nothing to do with physical location. Um, mm -hmm. You know, women everywhere complain the same, complain that there's no one to date. <laughs> Men everywhere complain that women are gold diggers. You know, I, that's so <laughs> true. When they ain't got no gold. Especially men who have no gold. Especially gold. men who have no gold for anyone to dig. So <laughs> it's got nothing to do oh. with Africa or not Africa. Um, it's got nothing to do with expats or not expats. It's 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 deeper than that. And you know, everywhere. Everywhere people feel like the grass the grass is greener somewhere else. I'm not know? moving. But, I'm not moving for a relationship. But in because... many ways the grass is greener. See in, Africa, in many many ways. in many ways yes but when I met you you were like oh, I think I might have to leave Kenya to find my husband <laughs> I was like dang I just got here <laughs> <laughs> hoping to fight <laughs> hoping that this was the greener grass <sighs> fortunately Africa is such a diverse place <laughs> that it is possible to and I feel like that that the the grass is gonna be greener for me, I think. Here, in West Africa. In West, I really people think keep it. telling me to go to I really think it. I really think it. I really think those it is. men are very beautiful, yes, and yes. confident and all that. Yeah. But they are they are also polygamous. They are also polygamous. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, that really came home to me when I was in Senegal, 
because the men are just undeniably gorgeous and amazing but they've been married since they were in their early 20s right so if they are looking at you it's because in their heads they can entertain a polygamous situation so now it's on you to decide whether or not you can deal with that mm -hmm. so let's get down to the topic <laughs> okay the chasm between african americans and africans yes does it exist? I think that there is a chasm, mm -hmm. but I think that it's not, it's a question of how we are perceiving each other. I think that the history of, of time, the history of how African Americans came to be African Americans, has made it so that we are looking at each other from uh, from yes a real chasm but it is it's more of a culture it's more of a difference of culture mm. I don't think it's real mm. <laughs> and I'll tell you why I say that so <clears throat> we have evolved differently and separately and so we don't reference slavery it's not our experience um, but <laughs> So what has happened is that we are now a separate, we're now different people looking at each other from over here like this with a little bit of suspicion. And I feel as if there are people, and we say Africans from the diaspora, who feel as though we threw them away. We didn't mm -hmm. fight mm -hmm. for them because it is true that there was African complicity, mm -hmm. you know, in slavery. Mm -hmm. It couldn't have happened otherwise. Mm -hmm. There were African chiefs who were actively involved. It made them very rich. They became very, very wealthy. Mm -hmm from participating in the slave trade. And so there's a resentment. There's a resentment um, from, and we say Africans in the, in the diaspora, so African Americans, but also Africans from the Caribbean. Yeah. I once had a Caribbean girl say to me, you know, you guys, you threw us away. You mm. didn't want us. Mm. And I have seen from living in London, the enmity that exists between Afro-Caribbeans and Africans. Like if there's a fight in a nightclub, it's Africans <laughs> on both ends of the spectrum who are fighting. It's Afro-Caribbean men and Africans fighting in a nightclub. Like there was that was always happening. I watched a fight on a bus happen Damn. between um, an African and, and an Afro-Caribbean person. Like it was really frightening. And there's that tension, there's that resentment that continues to exist. And we Africans are on this side saying, I wasn't in that story <laughs> I am of the 20th century I wasn't in that I wasn't in that deal so there is there is a tension there is also a culture divide very much so um, I was offering my dad a book uh, it was Michelle Obama's biography becoming mm -hmm. and I was like you know read this book it's really good and he was like I tried he was like I tried to read this book but then she talks about wanting Obama to do the dishes and I just can't deal with it. <laughs> so there is, <laughs> there is a, it's just a culture clash. It's just a culture clash. And um, there's a way that, I feel also there's a way that African Americans are looking to Africans for a sense of um, belonging. Mm. They're trying to regain a sense of, please, please don't be offended by my use of the word they. I hope, I hope that doesn't offend you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm speaking in general terms. Mm -hmm. There is a sense of wanting to regain a culture, a belonging that was lost um, by looking to mm -hmm. Africans. The irony of that is this. <laughs> we were not, we didn't cross the Atlantic in that way, but we do have to deal every day with the influence of colonialism that has left us without a proper sense of our history, without a proper sense of belonging. And so that's the irony. So while the African Americans are looking at us and being like, you know, help us feel like we belong, we are also sitting in our Africanness um, uncomfortably because mm. of what colonialism did to us. A lot of history has been was suppressed by white people who made it their business to change how we see ourselves, how we perceive ourselves, to see ourselves as less than. Mm. Um, there's a lot of suppressed history. It is today we are only just learning in bits and pieces about you know, our 
culture of, an, of our ancestry, mm. our um, parts of our culture that were suppressed because along with white people came Christianity. Yeah. And so that obliterated a lot of our history, a lot of our culture that we are only today beginning to reclaim. So um, it's a clash of cultures, it's a clash of civilizations for many different reasons. Mm. So it's, it's difficult. And I, when I meet African Americans, I see every shade. Um, I, I see every shade of that. So for, I never generalize. My life experience has taught me never to generalize. I meet yes. people and I treat them um, as, as individuals. So when I met you, I, I knew that I had met a kindred spirit <laughs> and you felt safe. My yeah. intuition told me this is safety. This is a safe person mm. to be friends with. And, and so we have related not as sort of African-American and African, but just related as individuals who have met and who yes. have found common ground with yes. each other. But when I meet African-Americans, we, we don't know each other. I feel like there's, I, I've met every shade. So I've met African-Americans who are feeling a little bit like, defensive are, are you gonna are they gonna uh, are, you know are these africans going to accept us do we have to fight for our place our space yet but i've also met african americans who are like help me find a sense of my africanness wow. <laughs> and then i have met african americans who are just like open to everything and those are sort of typically tend to be as you say younger who are out in the world to explore yeah um and you know so is that chasm there? I think it depends on the individual and their um, experience, their experience of Africa. I can tell you for sure, when I was growing up, we were obsessed, we were very much imbued in African American culture. I can mm -hmm. tell you that for sure. African American fashion, mm -hmm. um, the curly kit, my mother used to curly kit her hair because- You mean the Jerry Curl? Jerry Curl! <laughs> We called it a curly kiss, and you put the thing in your hair, and it was like that white thing, face, and it made your hair all curly like this. Oh my god, that was the fashion! Oh my god! In my mother's day, and that was what they did. That was they were like, oh, this is what they're doing in America. And she was like, comb this terrible junky style. All the grease, all the grease, so greasy. <laughs> and we were into African American fashion, African American um, music. Oh my goodness, I can't tell you how yeah. influenced yeah. we were by rap yeah. culture, by R&B. R&B was like the soundtrack of my teenage years, you know? Um, we were very much, we've, so we've taken a lot of African-American culture and made it our own. Yeah. We live our daily life um, to the beat of that, you know, to, it's to the point where in Kenya, they had to pass a law that, that made it so that broadcast um, the broadcast media had to reserve 40% for local content. Otherwise, wow. it was all sort of African-American rap and R&B and, and sort of African-American culture. So you were a teenager. When you were a teenager, where were you? I was in Cote d'Ivoire. Cote d'Ivoire. And you were still getting a lot of African-American. Very much. Very much. Mm -hmm. Very much. To date, even now. Yeah. Even now. We were watching the Cosby Show. We were watching Good Times. We were watching, you know, we, we looked to America for our entertainment. And we didn't understand um, all those dynamics about the portrayal of white of black people, you know, in the mm. media. We didn't we didn't get that dynamic at the time. I'm only really just beginning to understand it now. But at the time we just thought those were cool shows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, Bill Cosby so how would you recommend that black diasporans connect with like-minded Africans? Yeah. Um, first of all, I, I, I would say, you know, be clear about sort of what your interest areas are and then connect with people from that. So if you have an interest in tech, entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. it is possible there's a whole community, you know, you can plug into. So find, find your areas of, um, mm -hmm. find your kindreds. Um, also know know why you're here you know find find individuals who can connect you to all the little cultures mm -hmm. that that exist but you know in nairobi for example um so i think um, those are good 
I think those are good, really good suggestions because just when you think that your interests are so niche, mm -hmm. you meet somebody who's like, oh no, I'm into crypto. <laughs> and I'm in, I'm in this crypto group. <laughs> exactly, you exactly. Know? And yeah. you know, there are online groups that you can even connect and connect with before you arrive. Exactly. So that you arrive to a community. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And one way for me to easily uh, fit into a particular group I'm a bit of an introvert. I'm a social introvert, so I'm not actively seeking um, connection with humans until I'm ready. Same. <laughs> same. <laughs> Extroverted introvert. Yeah. You know, but just um, as an expat, these Facebook expat groups, yep. you know what I mean? Yeah. Just just get what you can <laughs> and get out. You know what I mean? Just, just dip a toe in. You don't have to swim in the pool. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then also there's WhatsApp groups mm -hmm. where you can ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, and then once you meet somebody, you know, kind of politely mind them for information. If someone's into into sharing this, ah, I'm in this group. Tell me to add you to this group. I finally connected to like this spiritual, you know, woo woo groups in Kenya, mm -hmm. and it's been so much. I'm like, it's too much happening <laughs> every day. It's, it's you know a different divine feminine and meditation and chakra alignment it's happening right here it's happening right here again it's a symptom of um, um, Africans unpacking right unpacking a culture that is uh, that used to be that doesn't exist so much anymore but we are in the process of digging that out and making it part of our everyday lives and so that's that's how you're able to find these groups and connect with them because we are actively reconnecting yeah yeah that's great. beautiful you said so much i think the thing that stuck out the most to me was uncomfortable in our africanness and you know i would say that if you're looking for a very specific type of africanness you know one that you think might be um more rooted to the earth um, one that is, you know, very colorful and very tribal. That's right. You're not going to find it in any city. Yeah. But you're definitely not going to find it in Kenya. Yeah. Yeah. It's harder. Yeah. You know, yeah. when I was in Ghana, yeah. like back in the nineties, I would see women with shaved heads and they were bare breasted, these spiritual women in the city, you know, mm -hmm. but that was very uncommon, mm -hmm. you know, um, but I also feel like people confuse African pride mm -hmm. with display. Mm -hmm. So I've heard people say things like, but you know, in, in East Africa, I've heard East Africans say, but in West Africa, they love their culture so much and look how they do this. That's display, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a different history, there's a different trade history, different trade routes. Yeah. And so in West Africa, where people wore textiles more historically, in East Africa, it was more, um, what's it called, bark cloth yes. and skins. Mm -hmm. and so it, that display is going to be very different. Right. right. But I'll say, I did not expect you to say that there was a chasm. Really? I didn't expect you to say <laughs> that. But I like how you brought in the African Caribbean perspective because I have a limited experience with that okay. the people that I know mostly from the Caribbean their parents or their grandparents are from the Caribbean right. they're very much American in a certain type of way yeah and um, and they're very much perceived as black American by outsiders um, my experience I haven't had that mm -hmm. I have not experienced that chasm mm -hmm. however I did have to grow up in my understanding of being African-American. Mm -hmm. So I, I minored in African studies and I've been working and going to school in Africa since I was like 18, mm -hmm. off and on. This is the longest period of time that I've been in Africa. Yeah. And um, I've never had anybody just be like, like, nah, you're not one of us. Mm -hmm. Or we don't like you because of this, that, and the third. Um, more so I've had people claim like oh you're one of us or you're my tribe or you're my I've even had people fight over like <laughs> tribe. I 
felt like the chasm existed more in the 60s, yeah. which would have affected our parents who were baby boomers. Yeah. Um, and I don't know exactly why that was, because there was a contingent of African Americans fighting for freedom. Let's let's be real, it's a small percentage. And then there was a contingent of Africans fighting for freedom. Mm -hmm. And so our leaders, right, our leaders were interacting. However, I think when Africans came to the U.S. for education during that time, there was some conflict there. Yeah. And I, I don't really know the, the root. Yeah. Why that happened, how it happened. Yeah. I, I'm guessing that maybe, um, uh, maybe, maybe some of the African freedom fighters, the ones who were fighting colonialism, were able to get resources and money, mm -hmm. were able, um, from, you know, from, from, from white people. So, for example, from the Kennedy family, was definitely supporting um, the freedom some of those efforts. Here. Yes. Okay. There was, the, you know, the airlifts. Um, I don't know if you know about the airlift no. in the 60s. Mm -hmm. So, I think it was the Kennedy family, uh, well, let me just say sort of richer, wealthier American families who came together to put a fund that, that financed um, young Africans men mostly mm -hmm. um to come in plane loads from africa from uh, kenya mostly uh i think to to america mm -hmm. to study with a view that they would get the skills and come back to post-colonial mm. kenya and grow their country and so maybe i don't know for sure maybe there was you know the, maybe the african american freedom fighters of that time were seeing Maybe would look like a favoritism. Ah, you see. There's there's jealousy and again jealousy and perception. Yeah. Because huh, it's been like it's been so thought provoking and like the way my brain just goes into overload when I think about my friends, people like yourself, whose parents and uncles, grandparents, great aunts and uncles were at Oxford on full scholarship. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, at a time, at a time when... When we couldn't even read. Like, we weren't, like, you, I'm talking about the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, and on up, you know, just Ivy League, <laughs> international education. Yes, My right. friend's parents, right. uh, her uncles, uh, they were ordering suits by catalog from England, right? And I'm like, okay, these are black and white photos. <laughs> and in the US, we're being denied education, right. you know, we're being murdered haphazardly, yeah. you know, yeah. planned and haphazardly. And but over here, they was getting education. <laughs> you know, so the, the colonizers, the you know, colonialists was just like, we need someone to run our empire and we don't have enough Europeans who want to come over to do that. So now we're going to educate the African populace, right? Meanwhile, we're being told that we're stupid, you know, lazy, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I do see how that happened. And, but also there's an uncomfortableness in our blackness. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So here you are uncomfortable in your Africanness and we are uncomfortable in our yeah. blackness. Yeah. You know, I had a dean of students tell me in law school, you know, a, a, a more fair-skinned black woman with short natural hair. And she was just like, impressed. I was wearing my hair natural. And she was just like, when I first started wearing my hair natural in the 60s, my, grand, my mother wouldn't talk to me. She was ashamed of me. She was like, she said it was like the neighborhood was like, you are revealing our dirty secrets oh, wow. about our how our hair really oh, is. Oh, wow. And so I'm sure you've been, I think we've all been in those spaces where you show up and people dislike you because you remind them of something that they are ashamed of or something yes. that they don't have. Oh, certainly. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. And so now I'm sitting here and, you know, um, there was an influx of African scholars at a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting over here in the 20s through the 50s and even the 60s even. And I'm like, I'm colored. I'm, I'm colored. 
And then you come over here with a slightly different phenotype. Yeah. And you you're representing this thing that I've been running from. Yes. So yeah. now, you know, I'm going to do my human thing and I'm going to otherize you and I'm going to call you names and stuff. Like those of us who grew up within a certain time period, that term African booty scratcher mm -hmm. was rampant. Yeah. It was like a diss on the playground. Yeah. And you didn't have to be African to be called that. You mm -hmm. just had to be dark skinned. Oh, gosh. You, know, you just had to be dark skinned. You African booty scratcher. I'm like, where did this come from? So, you know, I grew up in a household where I had parents on opposite ends of this, the color spectrum. Oh. I just thought that's how black people were. Oh. So when I existed in these non-black spaces, I had no other reference besides my parents. But then, you know, every now and again, I would go to school with black kids or be, live in a black community mm -hmm. and I would hear these slurs. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this is interesting. What, what is this and where does it come yeah. from? So, okay. It's interesting, it's interesting you say that because, you know, my look is my look. I, I never met my Tanzanian grandmother, but I think I look like her mm. from the pictures that I have seen. And I am a throwback <laughs> kind of <Like> girl. <laughs> so I, you know, my dark skin, I'm, I'm dark skin like my grandfather. And, but I'm dark skinned in a way that African women don't like to be dark skinned and they would do all sorts of things. So, you know, everywhere I would go in West Africa, women would be offering me light skin, skin lightness. Or if I walked into a pharmacy looking for something for eczema, um, one time a pharmacist was like, are you sure you're going to use this to, to, for eczema? Where's the rash? I want to see the rash. Ooh. Because women would walk into the, to the, to the pharmacy, buy you know, eczema cream and use it to lighten their skin because it does lighten your skin. Oh. Or, or I would walk into a beauty store and I'd want a particular cream. It wouldn't be available, but then they'd be like, but this is. This is available. This will help your skin and make it lighter. And, you know, so I think my, my moving through the world looking the way I do in my, in my most natural self is offensive to many Africans who are like, we have moved on past this. How are you still missing this? <laughs> how are you still? We have how, how are you still friends? looking this like there's relaxer, there's skin like like we've moved on past this. Please, like, you know, get with the program. I beg. There's yeah. I mean the poor livers, you know, these people's livers. I've also in Zim, um, someone tried to sell me some skin light and I think it might have been illegal at the time. Mm. So it was like hush hush. No, no. You know, and I was offended. You know, I was a student. I think I was like 18. And I was just like, I don't use that, you know. And everyone was offended. Just like, oh. you, what, do you, what do you mean? I'm just so surprised. You're not dark enough for someone to offer you skin lightener. Why would I offer you skin lightener? I must have, I get, you know, I can go there. You know, I have been, <laughs> I have been volunteering in the hot sun in the refugee camp. So I can, <laughs> maybe that's what it was. Um... Yeah, wow. and then living in Zanzibar, mm. you got to be careful with those beauty products mm. because it's skin lightener and damn near everything. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, I, you know, I would have to go to the little side, whatever, little side road store as I need soap without <laughs> lightener, without bleach. And then now everybody's confused. <laughs> what did she say? Did she just say? without bleach yes so you have to read the packaging you know what i mean oh and then but there's something else you said african americans or those of us in the diaspora looking to africa and africans for approval and acceptance mm -hmm. and me i'm just living my life mm -hmm. i'm be real i'm just living my life um i moved to zanzibar because zanzibar is a tropical place and then i got rooted and i'm just like oh this feels really good why does this feel good why why do i feel so relaxed now and then oh because of the everyday uh microaggressions yes. and hyperaggressions yes. that i experience that's why i feel so you know and i can walk into a place and let's just it's an next fatty place and and i belong nobody's looking at me yes. like yeah. What oh, who does she know? Here? Yes, exactly. What is yes. she doing? How she must she be here? somebody. Is she a musician? Mm, you yeah. know, I get people, oh, she like, are you a musician? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the yeah. only way you could be up in yes. here with us. Are you? Are you trying to <laughs> <tell us? laughs> You must have money. You mm -hmm. must be like Erica Badu. Do you mm -hmm. sing? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. So that, uh, but I, when I was in Uganda, I met a sister from the, uh, she grew up in the UK, but her lineage was in the Caribbean and she, she wanted to buy me lunch. So we had a long conversation and she was like, no, you will never be accepted. <gasps> you know, they will never fully accept you. You'll never be one of them. And she was married to a Ugandan man. Oh no. Had kids with him, everything. Mm -hmm. And I was just, you know, I, sometimes I just take things in. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just listening. And I'm thinking that's what she came here for. To she, be accepted. Yes, exactly. To find, to, to, to regain. Yeah. And, and I can see how that community might have othered her. Because mm. she would have arrived sounding different, speaking different, mm -hmm. maybe having different, you know. Mm -hmm. She's just not from there. But I don't think that that, you know, and so they, they kind of not hold their heads against her, but would have treated her slightly differently. And so maybe maybe she experienced that uh, that as I'm not being accepted. Yeah. But I, <laughs> I, I, I want to say, so I had uh, my Auntie Verna. I call her Auntie Verna because she was just around in my all the years of my life mm. and so but she was african she was she was from the she was from the caribbean mm. and she was married to a ugandan mm. um but she was very much part of the community and she never lost that accent mm. she never she never tried to be anything other than who she was but yes. she also integrated into the community very very well oh, she was at nice. every party she was cooking ugandan food like there was no there wow. was no but she always remained herself but um and I don't think that she was ever othered or treated differently. But at the same time, she was different. She was my auntie. Yeah. But she was different. But it was not in a toxic way. Mm. Like, I think we all accepted her differences. Yeah. And she accepted that she was different from us. Yeah. Um, but she was also part of the community. She was Auntie Verna. <sighs> Jeez, I so wonder if I know her. Or I think people were like trying to get me to meet her. She's still in Uganda. Mm -hmm. Yep, people trying to get me to meet her. I never met her. I think at the time she was in Entebbe and I was in Kampala. I never. She's the one. I never met her. <laughs> you know, the, I think, I don't know where that comes from. I'm, immediately I think, oh, someone who's a people pleaser or someone who, I don't know where that desire comes from. Yeah. Because me, I never needed that or wanted that i mean we're a social species yeah so we all want a place to belong but for each of us it's to varying degrees right exactly and so that the moral of the story is don't come here looking for identity don't exactly. come here looking for a sense of belonging right already know who you are and i talked right. about briefly yeah. having to grow up That's a good one. in my culture so I grew up thinking that we were some watered down version mm. of African. Oh, right. And, and if Africans are the original people, then everything that we do is rooted in Africa. Mm. But it's so, somehow watered down. Mm. And I kind of, I bought into this notion that we did not have a culture. Mm. Even after studying four years, African studies, and, and you know, being very much African American, we're talking about centuries, but it wasn't until I moved here that I began to see, wow, so much of African culture is African American culture. Mm -hmm. Like you said, the, the music, the way of expressing, period, whether it's fashion, whether it's speaking, right um and then social media has only exacerbated that that's right you know yeah. I, I feel like there's there might be a little bit more exchange where african americans are getting a bit more exposed to african culture through music however i don't think mm, it's kind of weak i think it's really it's really a unilateral thing and um with that being said, um, where was I going with that? Just the, um, oh, so what I began to realize being here is like, oh, we do have a culture. We created our own. That's right. We really have, we really have our own shit. There's no, yes. 
And it, it's really our own shit. Right. And, you know, no one else is like us, just like no one else is like Jamaicans. You know what I'm saying? And then at the root of all of that, at the root of Cuban culture, Afro-Cuban culture, African-American, is Africa. And how you and I even are sitting here engaging, the way we're talking, the way, you know, I'm, I'm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's a very African thing. I thought everybody did that until my Italian friend was like, you're going to have to teach me that language. <laughs> Because all this, mm mm, mm hmm, mm, I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> but you, you know exactly. Know. Know. <laughs> yeah, it feels very natural. That's how we listen. Yeah. We listen actively. <laughs> we listen actively. We, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no, you're right. Um, I think that um, an African American coming into Africa must be on a personal quest. To find, mm. um, I mean, if if the, if if that's very important, you know, finding finding your African roots, then let that be a personal quest. But don't arrive expecting to find Ooh, it on the street, baby. Don't arrive expecting, you know, yeah. it's no. We we are also Africans dealing with a different influence. We're dealing with the effects, the long ranging effects of 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 having colonizers on our land. Sometimes only different groups of colonizers that have come and that's gone. right. Portuguese people. German people and Spanish people. And so we have taken their languages, we have taken their cultures, we have been indoctrinated, we've had our brains washed by their ways of thinking. So we are also dealing with our own identity yeah. issues, you know, and so it's, um, so nothing that you see, you should take personally, <laughs> first of all, um, take Africa the way it is. It is a land of many, many influences, many languages, many cultures. And all those influences have been good for Africa in many ways and terrible for Africa in many ways, mm. you know. So mm, it's a place of great contrast, Africa in general. Um, and, I, and I hate to speak about Africa in general terms like that, but Africa is a place of great contrasts. And um, we, you, you, you should come understanding, though, that Africa is also a place of great opportunity. Yes. So much opportunity. Yes. So much opportunity for Africans, for for foreigners coming into Africa, for Africans in diaspora returning to Africa. It is still a place of amazing opportunity. So much. The marketplace is wide open. So wide open, particularly mm -hmm. now. If you're interested in the tech space, that space is only just beginning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So much creativity exists here. So much energy exists here. Um, um, if you're coming from the US with a strong currency, you can go get your oyster. You can have whatever life you're looking for. You really can. You really and see, can. that's why I wanted to have Janet on because I follow her on Instagram. And I was just like, Janet... <laughs> You post a video of, you know, some black person being mistreated and you're like, come home. <laughs> what are you still doing now? Why? Just come home. Why are you still, you know, and my thing is this, you know, Africa can be a lot on the senses. I was telling my dad that because mm. I'm bringing my mom here mm. and people have been telling me just trick her because she's like, mm. I want to speak English and I like modern things. So she's like, I don't want to come. But she's been unwell, and I'm her only child. I'm just like, I can't do nothing for you thousands of miles away. You need to come. And, you know, my family's just like, well, just trigger, just tell her she's coming for a vacation. And what? You know, our birthdays are two days apart. We're both Scorpios. That's not good. You know, this, we got fire and fire. So I said, you know, Africa can be a lot on the senses. I don't want to do that to her. However, we got 54 countries, right? Mm -hmm. 54 countries with multiple influences, yeah? Um, like cultural influences, historical influences. That's you right. talked about the different colonizers, yeah. also the movements of African peoples That's throughout right. the continent, right? right? And maybe you don't want to like uproot, maybe you're uh, unsure about your finances, buy some property. Do you know you can buy an island in Uganda, Lake Victoria, $10,000? Mm -hmm. 
By the time it's underwater, you'll be dead. Don't even worry about it. You know what I'm saying? You built by, uh, think about your legacy, a vacation home. Come for the summer. Come for, a, come for the winter. Season. That's right. Come you know, winter. and the more you come, the longer you're going to stay. But I do want to touch on something else that you said. You said, uh, you know, we don't really have that history of slavery here. But East Africa does. Because right. of those points of departure. Exactly. So there, you know, there are these forts that are, you know, the I think the Spanish or the Portuguese, Portuguese may have built them yeah. and the British fought for them. Mm -hmm. This is a lot, you know, happening along the coast. And there were people that were brought as far west from as far west as Cameroon yeah. to East Africa. Yeah. And so the interesting thing about, you know, African American culture, my friend's dad calls us like the super Africans because we are an amalgamation of so many different tribes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But along the coast, there was so much of that, but those Africans were taken to the Arab world. Mm -hmm. They were taken to Asia. Mm -hmm. And um, and the history is also not being taught. Yeah. So in a place like Zanzibar, where they don't speak any Luo, Lu they don't speak, they only speak Kiswahili. Mm -hmm. Those people are like, oh, we were never slaves. <laughs> so it, you know, again, coming here and thinking that you're going to connect with people who are going to show you a specific type of way of being right. more African, right. it's not going to happen right. because the knowledge base is not there. Yeah, there's also yeah, there's also like a lack of information. There's a lack of um, uh, knowing our own history, partly because some of it was suppressed the colonizers suppressed that history because they knew on plummetry it would be, you know, or they would be never be able to subjugate, you know, people if they knew the truth. So a lot of that history is sub is is um suppressed history. It's only just beginning to come out in dribs and drabs now. But also the school system doesn't support Oh my gosh. Right? Doesn't support um a knowledge of, mm -hmm. of a real knowledge of our roots. So I, I didn't go to school in Kenya, but I know that in Kenya we, you know, it's a taught about the, the cultural diversity, you know, of, mm. of Kenya mm. and all the different tribes and all the different um, cultures oh, cool. and, you know, kids learn about that, but they don't learn about why our society is the way it is today. So they don't really have a reference point. They don't understand. So we are very, we are a very reactive generation. We just come and we find that there's a subtle racism and we're just like we don't know why that is yeah we don't understand yeah. we don't understand enough about what happened in the past yeah to be able to place that so it's today we are coming into that understanding you know we're reading more we are doing more of that research on our own we are understanding right. you know what is what is what is happening but the school system is not necessarily supporting that but you know you could also say that the function of school is to teach you how to learn so you go off on a journey of lifelong learning mm -hmm. so you know so there's that so that launches you off into that so so um i'm sorry I lost my train no of it's okay because to hear kenyans talk about the school system here i wouldn't even think that they even learned about the different ethnic diversity mm -hmm. it's just like oh, we just learn about the colonizer we just learn about the british i'm like oh that's so sad yeah. that that still happens i will say that it feels good to have somebody say, welcome home. Yeah. You get that a lot in West Africa. Yes. But you can also get exploited a lot in West Africa because they know, like, this sister, this brother is here to connect to their roots. I'm going to help them connect to their roots <laughs> through their pockets. You know? <laughs> Oh my gosh, there's so many like chiefdom ceremonies, right? Oh. Where it's like, I'm going to make you the chief. I'm going to make you the queen mother. And then they slaughter like a couple of goats, you know, for 50 people. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, now this is your village. Now go out and raise money for your village. I've been to one of those. I'm just like, oh, <laughs> that's terrible. I see what's happening. What? Oh, wow. But this it's business. But the person who was being crowned, he had no, he was just, ah, Baba, you know, he, <laughs> yes, this is my, I was like, oh Lord. And I was only like 21 seeing this. And I was like, I see what's happening. <laughs> okay. But then I uh, went on a visa run. 
from Uganda to Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And I was on this bus. And um, this we stopped in Kigali. And this man got up and he said, welcome home. <laughs> and I wasn't expecting that. Mm -hmm. But it felt, he was like, this is, he looked me in the eyes and he said, this is your home. Mm -hmm. Welcome home. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I didn't know that that was the welcome that I needed. Mm -hmm. You know? So even though, you know, my ancestry can be traced to West Africa, mm -hmm. um, Africa is my home. Yeah. And I feel at home no matter where I am, except for maybe North Africa. <laughs> I'm just like, I don't feel safe. <laughs> you know? But there were, a, you know what I will say, I don't want to slander North Africans. I was on a train with these women who, in the U.S., they wouldn't be considered black, but they were very brown. You might think they were biracial, phenotypically. Mm -hmm. But they really identified with me, mm -hmm. and they fought for me on mm -hmm. that train oh, because wow. we was hot, and somebody tried to close the window, and it says, if you hot, close your window. <laughs> don't close their window, you know? And they wanted to do my henna and everything. But for the most part, I did not feel safe there. Mm -hmm. um, however, it's something that I can only speak for myself. You know, this sense of belonging, it has to come from within. And I like to say I'm a citizen of the world. Yeah. And, you know, Africa isn't the only place where I feel the vibration. Mm -hmm. Madrid at one point was that for me. Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. Mm -hmm. at one point was that for me. Mm -hmm. And now I'm just like, this is, this is my home. It's, yeah. I've been very conscious and intentional about remaining here, yeah. even though Asia seems to be cheaper. <laughs> and functionally, so. better, but, you know, I'm at home. I'm home for now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 I see sort of, um, I, I was reading, um, that novel, um, by, um, Barack Obama and his, that first visit that chronicles his first visit to Kenya mm. and he lost his luggage oh. and he went, you know, he was at the airport now his luggage was on the runway and he went to the desk to report his bag missing and he said his name. She said, you know, what's your name? He said his name and she was like, oh. And was this before or after he was president? Oh, it was long before. Long before. Okay. So, in, you know, so the book is, you know, long before. So he, and he, it was such a moment for him because, you know, he's carried this name Obama in a culture that just others him for that name. Yes. And suddenly somebody recognized that name. Mm -hmm. Because the Obamas, everybody knows the Obamas, right? Oh, okay. there is a, you know, a family <laughs> that people recognize that name. Yes. And she was like, oh, you're an Obama. And he said, it was such a moment for him. Wow. And I will never, I think that's the most memorable part of, of the book for me. Oh. The moment when he was like, oh, there's a place in the world where people know me and recognize me and make me feel like I'm, I'm home, you know. And nobody, what kind of name is that? <laughs> Whereas everywhere he went, it was like, hey, what kind of name is this? So, so, so that was, that was a really lovely moment for me. But I, I, I would say that, you know, to, to, to be, African American and to come to Africa is is a homecoming in many ways, and in in other ways it's travel to another place like it would be for anywhere else. If you went to China, you would have to take the same precautions. Right. You would have to approach it the same way. Um, but but I would say, as I as you say, I I watch the news, and I just think this cannot be the way to live. This is not this is not it. This isn't it. You know, we have our problems in Africa, but I think that there's a way that you can walk the street and feel proud to be African, to be in Africa. I have lived in the UK and I know what it's like to be able to, to find work, to always be worrying that your papers are going to expire, mm. to, to worry, to, to do heavy calculations about whether or not you should go certain places. Mm. Because, you know, am I, am I gonna be safe there? Mm. Is it gonna be okay? When I'm in Kenya, I never worry about that. When I'm in Africa, I never worry about that. I can walk the streets and feel safe um, that I'm not going to be stopped because I'm black or, or treated with suspicion, you know, because I am who I am. You know, I don't, I don't worry about little things like that. I don't, I don't worry 
about that anymore. So when people say to me, you know, I was um, um, dating someone mm -hmm. <laughs> who suggested to me that maybe, you know, would I like to come back to the UK with him? And I just thought, you know what, I've moved on past that point. <laughs> Where I don't worry about my legal status in a country. I've moved on past that point where, you know, I I have to <laughs> I have to, you know, no. No. Mm. <laughs> if you said to me, let's move to Mozambique, I can entertain that. <laughs> if you said to me, you know, let's go see what's good in Rwanda, yeah. you know, I can entertain that. But don't put me in a situation where I have to arrive at customs. And explain what I'm doing here. And bundle oh, up, baby. Ah, bundle up you know, seven months I'm after the year. Over it. <laughs> That's not the life I want to live anymore. I, there's other places to live that, you know, for that being in my black skin is even an asset. You know, I'm just not interested in, in, in no longer living. You know, I want to go to those places to shop. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go to those places, you know, because I, you know, there's certain things I'm looking for. And, and the world is today that I don't even have to be there anymore. Exactly. Like that's what Amazon is for. I can order that stuff. Exactly. So there's places to explore. And I feel like um, as an African who has grown up in certain parts of Africa, there's so much that I don't know yeah. that I still want to discover. Mm -hmm. You know, so come, let's, let's discover. Let's, let's discover. discover. Isn't she wonderful? <laughs> Isn't she wonderful? I have to have you back <laughs> and I think maybe talk about the creative community oh, here in Kenya because oh I know gosh. you're a reader. Oh, wow. Yes. Oh. So. I told you there's so much. <laughs> and it's like there was a period of not, no, there was a period when there was a burst of creativity and then that was kind of suppressed and mm -hmm. that kind of post colonial period. Mm. And then. There's been another explosion. There's been another like explosion in the last, let me say, 30, 50 years, you know. And then there's all this literature, and then there's all the, there's so much, there's so much, there's so much to discover if you're a creative spirit. Okay, so that is it for us today. I think we've covered everything. And I'm going to share your details so you can follow her on IG. Perhaps hire her for some writing, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Tonto. Thanks, everyone. Out there. See you. See you when you move. <laughs> see you when you get here. <laughs> Thank you for joining me on this episode of Blacks Into Africa. If you liked what you heard, please share and leave a review. May you thrive. May you be inspired. May you move with love and intention. Until next time.